before we proceed any further, I want to acknowledge that the Kugiru Aboriginal Art Collection is on the land of the Monica Nation and pay um, our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And since we're all joining from locations around the world, um, I want to acknowledge the nations um, where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those nations are um, or who those people are, that you find out and that you learn about them and their art and culture as well. Um, so welcome to this webinar about Sorry Day and how Australia, um, a little bit about how Australia has said sorry to the stolen generations and um, this amazing book um, that Coral and Dub collaborated on um, that really brings that history to light uh, and that story to light. Uh, without too much further ado, I'm going to pass it over to them who are going to share some experiences and stories with us um, and some of their knowledge. Um, so I'm going to warmly welcome Coral and Dub. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hi, how are we? Um, uh... It's, uh, it's great to be with you all. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's very natural, isn't it, Coral? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, um, you go first, Coral. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we wrote this book together. Uh, it's called Sorry Day, and it's, uh, we're delighted it's won so many awards here in Australia and has been so well received here in Australia and it's based on an event that happens every year here in Australia which is National Sorry Day which is the 26th of May and it's a day where we stop and we remember uh, the stolen generations of Australia and we remember uh, when the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said sorry to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here in Australia. And so sometimes on this day, you, you know, you, you might see the word sorry written in the sky. A plane comes along and it writes sorry in the sky. I guess they, they actually had that on the, on the day, didn't they? Um, and uh, actually at that moment, you can see in the, um, where the bridge, um, what's that bridge called? Harbour Bridge. <laughs> Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, everyone would have been walking across um, that bridge uh, at that time. Um, it's, uh... So 13, 13 years ago, uh, on the 13th of Feb, 2008, the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, he uh, made an historic public apology. And Dub, you were there on that day, weren't you? Yeah, yeah that was... Parliament House. Parliament House. That was, yeah, yeah, that was amazing. You... Um, yeah, I was living in Sydney at the time, and uh, we—I uh, was in an, an Aboriginal band <coughs> um, called the Black Turtles, and we uh, the, the singer he was from Hermansburg, and he was actually taken away when he was he was young for a few years, and so we had this um, a really tight um, friendship. We still do. And uh, he said, we're going to Canberra. We're doing a gig there. Um, and he said, there's going to be lots of black fellas. And, um, uh, and we ended up, you know, playing on, in the tent embassy um, on Parliament House lawn. And it was just such an amazing, like, it wasn't just um, um, Aboriginal people there. It was um, everybody was there. And uh, it had the whole gamut of emotions. It was, it was amazing. You know, people were crying and hugging and, um, and catching up and making new friends. It was, it was such a, um, a you know, dawn, it, it dawns on you when you're in the midst of it and you're like, okay, this is something really serious. And then um, you, you would see Kevin, we saw um, Prime Minister Kevin right on the screen and they're saying he's there. He's just in there, and you sort of oh, you know, it's um just like in just um yeah, like <laughs> I'm in the crowd there somewhere. I'm there. Yeah. It's, it was amazing, amazing day. Amazing. And and I guess for me, like I you know, I was home watching it on telly on TV, and 
the whole nation stopped, you know, everyone stopped to bear witness to that powerful word, sorry, um, because we knew that history was being made. Um, and, you know, as Dub said, thousands of people gathered on the lawns of Parliament House. Um, and it was it was almost like, you know, it was put telecasted all over all over Australia on big screens, on TVs, um, because it was it was like after so many decades of denial and debate here in this country, it was like finally, as a nation, we acknowledge, we finally acknowledge uh, what happened to the First Nations people here in Australia. And that was so powerful. It was so, so powerful. So Doug, do you want to explain about, you know, why did Prime Minister Kevin Rudd have to say sorry? Why was that important? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the um, most selfless um, moments that a, a, an Australian Prime Minister, um, you know, has under, undertaken. I think he, um, well, I mean, he just, you could just see where his heart was and he just was doing the right thing. And I... Um, You've, when you've written in the book, you know, the word echoed around, like it literally did, didn't it, that day? Um, being on, you know, you'd, you'd, you, would, you couldn't, um, uh, it's something you couldn't escape because, you know, you would go into the city, um, any city in Australia, and they'd, they'd have a screen, screen up and you would still be walking through, you know, buildings and stuff when it was... Um, his speech was um, it was echoing. You know, everybody could hear, and and a lot of people would just would stop, and they were listening. Um, I, you know, I mean, it was overdue, and I think, um, I mean, at, people from the um, Aboriginal community were, had you know been pushing for it for a long, long time, and um, but I think it, you know, what was powerful is that it came from. Um, the other side, if you will, you know, um, it's, they walked across the aisle and um, and met everybody halfway. Yeah. So yeah. you know, it's, it, it was yeah. I mean, it was definitely an important step forward. Yeah. And, um, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of a history lesson. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll give a you know brief history. Um, <laughs> so from from nineteen ten to nineteen seventy thousands of children here in Australia were taken away from their families under what was known as uh, the government's assimilation policy. And, and so those children today are known as the stolen generations. Um, so it was sort of believed between, you know, in that early sort of 1900s here in Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were actually disadvantaged and at risk in their own community. So we, you know, we would kind of look at that now and go that's ridiculous but at the time that was the thinking and you know there's there's movies like this one rabbit proof fence that that showed you know what what actually was happening here in australia where children were literally forced and taken out taken away from their families ripped out of the arms of their mums and aunties and out of out of their communities um because the Australian government at the time thought that Indigenous children would receive a better education, a more loving family, um, and a more civilised upbringing if they were adopted into white families. So they were taken out of their communities and put into white families and adopted. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we would look back on this now and we go, that's just so wrong, that thinking is so wrong, but at the time the government, you know, thought it was the right thing to do. And so... These kids, these children were then not only taken away from their mums and dads and communities, but they were sent over um, all parts of all over Australia. And some of them never actually saw their biological parents and, and families ever again. Um, I think they say at least 100,000, that's sort of a really, really conservative figure, uh, were removed from their parents, from their families. Um, it, it's, it was probably more. Uh, an estimate between one and three Aboriginal children were separated from their families. And so once they were removed, they were taught English and they were educated in their Western ways. And some of these children never even discovered that they were even Aboriginal, uh, never understood their, their Indigenous heritage until much later in life. Uh, so families were torn apart and prevented from teaching their children about their Indigenous culture. 
important connections to traditions, to language, to community and to country were broken forever. And that grief and that trauma is actually still very raw and still felt today, many generations later. It's, so just, it's, yeah. it's like, it's like um, uh, what I call a night move um, on a chessboard where you're looking in several different directions. You, um, and so, you know, the, the Australian government was, you know, basically they're breeding the black out of us. That was, that was one of their, um, you know, they wanted to make us white and they damn well near succeeded. Um, and, you know, and, you know, there, there was, and also when it comes to that, when you've broken, you know, the way to break a culture is you take the kids away. So it's, if there's no culture and there's no connection to land, well, um, uh, then the land is up for grabs even easier. You know, so there's a few, there was a few different things happening there um, with this one stroke, um, <clears throat> you know, and there's the, the, it was a cultural genocide. And they, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you hear stories of, of I heard one that uh, uh, where they were rubbing um a type of it was like a chalky blue stone and they would rub it into the eyes of the kids to try and make their eyes turn blue um you know stuff like that and uh and you know because of the the fairer kids um you know like myself um were easy picking you know an easy target back then and it was you know it was like a, it was a government sanctioned program really um which is i think you know that's you know you've got no other option to to apologize for that you know that abhorrent behavior you know it's more than um you know that doctrine um it's uh yeah you know it's just uh it's you, you like I th I'm saying the words now, and you just you uh, you try and grapple with it, and you go, I can't. You still can't believe that that went on, you know. And you'd meet you'd meet people. Um, I've met um, um, quite a few Aboriginal people that were taken away, and um, and I, my myself being adopted um, from birth, um, we, you know, it's. And some of like some of my mates, they were taken hundreds of miles away from um, their family, and and sometimes they were tricked. You know, they said, "Oh, come on, we um, come on, you girls, we're going for a ride. We're going to the shops, or we're going to the movies." And they would take them to a settlement somewhere. Um, you know, days later, or you know, they'd tell them that their parents had died, or their parents didn't want them anymore. You know, that's a terrible thing to do to children. So I, I went off on a tangent there. No, I think <coughs> it's a really good tangent. Actually, there's a question that just came in. And even though we're not in the q and A, I'm going to kind of ask it now because I think um, in this part where sort of we're talking about the stolen generations and what happened there, um, it's pretty relevant. So this person asked, um, did the government think they were helping the indigenous people or were they simply trying to create a class of workers? Um, oh, that's, yeah. I, th look, I, th I, um, I mean, cause most of the, the, um, you know, it was, it was akin to slave labor where, um, children were taken away then they trained, the, the girls were trained as domestics and, um, the, the men were, were trained, um, you know, to, to work on cattle stations or, you know, um, to be subordinates. And, and um, it's, you know, often without pay, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, and so there's all these stolen wages as well and um, basically slave labour. Um, so, you know, I think in two, two ways they were, um, I think it was under the guise of helping Aboriginal people, and I think that was for um, the wider Aboriginal population, uh, the wider Australian population, where um, so just sort of fooling, you know, fooling them. Oh, well, we're going to save the, you know, um, 
our indigenous people and um, it's a, it was you know that it's sort of the double handed trick um, yeah the way the way that i've like from what i've read understand it is th there was like sort of a paternalistic attitude that was racist in nature obviously and then at the same time there was this um motivation for the labor and the work like the, cl the this class of workers that deb you just spoke to but then also there's sort of this destruction of culture that you just spoke to as well which kind of um legitimizes sort of the the white australian culture and sort of rids that rids the dominant um um population from that sort of like guilt and presence of of indigenous people so it's sort of it's you know it's one of the what what you were just talking about dub and i think one of the most important parts here is that it, it didn't just have one purpose it, it, yes. it like is so multi-layered right. um and mm -hmm. and the kind of destruction that it caused is also really multi-layered um so thanks for that question robin i think that kind of just brought that out and clarified it a little bit sorry yeah that's yeah yep. so we've got a i think i've popped in the slides a photo of dub with his mum oh yeah she's Beautiful just mom. tiny she was so tiny there yeah, yeah, see, um, yeah, I was, I was actually talking about um, this yesterday um, uh, at a few schools. Uh, how, you know, because I met her, I met mum when I was 25. And, uh, you know, so I, I've got this really interesting um, insight where I'm not stolen generation, but I'm Aboriginal and I was adopted out. Uh, and, you know, so I, yeah, you work, you walk the line and you, you see, um, uh, you hear all the good stuff and you hear all the bad stuff. And, um, you know, I just, I think like a lot of people, they, uh, it's, it's too hard for them to talk about the trauma, especially all, older people. And I've, um, and I've met some, some, some of those followers from, um, and they're in um, those infamous um, um, Aboriginal homes for children where they were mistreated. And, you know, they just, they can't talk about that stuff. And you know that it's affected them um, uh, really badly. And you can, you can just see the way that they react to, um, they interact with people now. Like it's destroyed the way that they have relationships with people. Um, because the relationships that they were shown when they were little um, were, you know, so uh, just so wrong. And, and you know, for, for me, I actually had to, um, I was saying yesterday, because I was what's called a state ward. And what, it's, that's what happens when you, you are adopted. <coughs> you become property of the government. And so I was a state ward for... Um, about three months, I was in hospital all that time um, from when I was born. And, you know, so you think of like it just, you know, you don't want to make it too personal, but you think about um, being, you know, when there's a, when a baby's born, you know, it's usually just the parents are there. And there might be a few hospital staff and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, and you're there maybe overnight or um, a few days or you go back, you know, go home that day. Um, and, and the only cries that you have to put up with uh, are your own. But I had to, uh, you know, I would have been in with all the other crying babies. And that's something that, um, and just that brings trauma, you know, just that separation. And as a consequence, I've got an aversion to loud noise. Um, and, uh, but I also have um, this, I'm told a really, really strong singing voice. It's, it's different to how I speak. And I think it's because I was crying, um, you know, trying to get attention over the top of those other babies. You know, so they, there's some things that, that people don't, um, don't think about. Like I didn't even think about those, that sort of trauma until, um, you know, maybe about 10 years ago. 
So it's, um, and, and those effects, um, and that's just sort of one part of it, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the effect that it has on, on people, it doesn't matter where they're from, you know, just when you do that to um, babies uh, up to young children, it's, um, you know, it, it's, 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 um, it's a steep climb after that. Yeah, so like, you know, Deb was sort of saying, not only were these children taken away from their, their families and their communities, but then they were, then became wards of the state and they were then put into government institutions. And so I don't know if we've got some slides on, um, they're in the, here we go, the, the end papers of the book, The Kinchilla Boys Home and The Kudamundra Girls Home. Um, and this is the, yeah, the, the boys' home um, gates. And I read somewhere that, and I think Dub, you know, you concur with this, that the boys that went through these gates, they were no longer known as by their names. They were known as numbers. Numbers, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I read yeah. one, sorry, Dub, you go. Um, no, you, yeah, you go. You, you keep. Um, and I just read, I read one uh, interview. Uh, with an Aboriginal uh, man called Michael, and he said, um, and he was treated absolutely atrociously in this home, the Kinchilla Boys Home, and he said, we thought everybody knew what was happening to us. We thought everyone knew. We thought the whole of Australia knew, and, and yet no one knew. You know, the Australians were ignorant to what was happening to these children and to these families and to these communities. And so it wasn't until sort of uh, years and years later in 1995 on the 11th of May that the Federal Attorney General here in Australia, Michael Lavarch, he, he undertook a, um, it was part of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, a, 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 he, he basically put together, wanted to put together a report um, in response to the general public ignorance relating to the forcible removal of children from their families here in Australia. And, and so this report took two years to, to be put together. It, it came out in, two, in 1997 and it came out on the 26th of May. So very significant mm. date. And in the following year, uh, we had national our first National Sorry Day here in Australia. So slowly things were sort of starting to come to light. People's stories were, were starting to be heard. But then finally, it took another whole 10 years later uh, for the Prime Minister at the time to, to give a national apology. And that happened on the 13th of February, 2008. Um, and so now we celebrate National Sorry Day on the 26th of May and National Reconciliation Week from the 27th of May to the 3rd of June every single year. So is that is that why you wrote? Um, you, you know, is that the impetus for writing Sorry Day, Coral? Yeah, absolutely. I look. I recognise that there were so so few resources relevant to children uh, here in Australia to help them understand more about this important part of Australia's history. It's it's so crucial to who we are as a nation, our our history, but also the history then helps us understand. A, a, and 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 make for a better future. Um, the more we know, the more we can, you know, the more we can uh, learn, the more we can um, move forward as a nation. And so I started to listen to people's accounts and read their stories and, and interview people. And, and the more I read, um, the more I listened, the more I was convinced that these stories behind um, the stolen generations and the national apology, they're in, so integral, they're so crucial, they're part of Australia's history, but also part of Australia's present. And they must be taught uh, in order for the next generation of young people um, for us to grow as a nation. They, you know, we all need to know these things. We need to know what happened so that we can never repeat it, but also uh, move forward and, and where there's forgiveness and there's um, and reconciliation and working together as, as a nation. So, yeah, so that's why I wrote this book. Um, I just saw that it, it, it was so crucial and there was nothing like it here in Australia. It's, a, and um, like we, we were talking before about how, um, 
you know, it's been out for three years and still, um, like I was at a teacher's conference yesterday and um, about two thirds of the, of the teachers, they're all principals, two thirds of the principals hadn't um, read the book and, um, you know, we'd do, we were doing an event um, on, on Sorry Day. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this, and I, where I am now on the North Coast, you can see that the, and the Aboriginal culture is, is celebrated, it's not shunned. Um, there's Aboriginal flags in like the barbershop. Um, uh, you know, there's an Aboriginal presence in town. People use Aboriginal words when they greet each other. Um, not just Aboriginal people, you know, it's, and, um, uh, but there's still that, that part that's lacking, I think. I mean, and the good thing is that people are willing to learn now, you know, and, um, but it's still surprising that you just, yeah, you know, because it is, and it's, it is in the, um, the Australian school curriculum, isn't it, Coral? It is, in, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where um, it becomes tricky because a lot of white educators, they don't want to disrespect that and, and yet they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to educate, you know, this, this part of Australia's history. And so they think they put it in the too hard basket and they go, oh, it's, it's, I, I don't know how to do it. And they become hamstrung. And so I think a book like this, what I've found with many um, white educators particularly is, they love this book because they, for them, it's just, I can just read this book. And then mm. so many questions come up and, and, and it's there, you know, it's such a great tool, such a great resource uh, for, for Australian teachers, but also for every Australian. I think we had one review and it said, you know, any, anyone between five and 105, you know, like everyone should read this book. Yeah. In Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, yeah, it was um, yeah, a balancing act getting that book right, you know, being able to. Absolutely. And I think, I think for me, you know, like I, 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 it's such a, it's such a tricky, it's such a tricky part to, well, idea to, um, to convey in a children's book, particularly to, to young, to young children about being stolen, you know, being taken away from your mums and dads. And so, and, and being lost and so I sort of thought to myself you know what how can how can a young child reading this book a white Australian or just average Australian person reading this book how can they kind of relate and I thought to myself well most kids have been lost you know like I was lost as a child um, and most kids have been lost and um, you know whether it be in a supermarket or a carnival or and and so I thought about this idea of being, you know, temporarily lost and paralleling that to, to being permanently lost. And that's why the book, if you've read it, um, has got, and Dub's done an amazing job with the illustrations, it's, it's two stories in one that are, that are paralleled. So it's Maggie and, and her mum who stand on the lawns of Parliament House and listen to Kevin Rudd give his National Sorry Day speech. Um, and she gets lost in the crowd. You know, she just temporarily loses her mum um, loses grip of her mum's hand and, and is temporarily lost. She's, you know, and the ending is she finds her mum again in the crowd. And just like any child that can get lost at a supermarket. Um, and then the second story is is the story of a group of young Aboriginal children who are playing hide and seek by a creek uh, on the day that they were taken away from their, their families and their communities and, and were permanently lost. And so there's these two stories. And Doug, you, I just, you know, am in awe of your illustrations and the way you illustrated and, and told this story with the two colour palettes and, and, yeah, just the amazing way you, you did that. And we've got some, yeah, storyboards up here. Do you want to, whether you want to speak to that? Um, it was interesting. Um, um, yeah, just researching the book, just sort of, um, you know, because you... Uh, you, you have to, even though I sort of, I, you know, I've sort of got some knowledge um, from um, growing up the way that I grew up, um, there's still, there's so many stories um, out there about the stolen generation 
from the stolen generation and just um you know delving into those like i i i cried when i was illustrating it um and not just from past stories and accounts um but from what people were saying at the time i was illustrating and the book um you'd yeah you would just go and there's, there's some racist junk out there and you can and so that would you know it would spur you on and you um because in some ways that's sort of that stuff is you know archaic and it that is sort of gone by the wayside or at least that thinking is and um it's you know that that really sort of was like well you know if you you can those people can feel that way but um you know i'm going to use that to create something positive um and it's uh like you know you you wait your your whole career to illustrate a book like this um because it's about your homeland you know and it's um and you get to share um share that with the world it's um you know it's such an um, it's it's an honor to to um to have, have worked on it coral it's yeah, it's just, you know, and, and would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, it's, uh, I remember when, um, yeah, when I met, when I met my family, when I met mom, she, you know, we traded photos. That was one of the first things we did. Um, so she would give me photos of when she was a kid and, and um, my brothers and sisters when they were kids and, and I was giving her photos of when I was a kid, you know. Um, and one of them, when she was um, when mum was little um, and it was just it was that classic um, movie moment you know she opened up this old box and had old stamps and things in it and she had this old photo and it was dog-eared and yellowed and um, and she just and I was like oh that's such a special photo and she just goes and she was really um, funny with photos keeping photos you know um, but she went here, you can have this photo. Um, and so I don't, I don't think she had any copies, you know? And so that when I, I would look at that, um, when I was first started working on the book and I just did, I just did a picture of that. And then I went, well, that's what, um, you know, this, the half of this, the book has to be like this, you know, it's got to be, you can see all those Browns, um, all the coffee that I was painting with back there and just, um, yeah, it, re it really cemented the look of the book. Um, and, um, I just knew it was going to be the, the, the right thing for it. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was going back and forth cause I was trying to see if that, that title the page, photos here, the photo. just on this page, this is yeah. in the middle uh, there. Yeah. There's a little bit here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's I was looking yeah. to see if it was if we had yeah. the, an image of just the page. Yeah. Oh, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, mm, I know. It's um... one of the things I love about about this book in telling the two parallel stories is, you know, Dubs used the sort of the more pastel colours for the. <laughs> For the sort of nowaday, which is Maggie, um, more set in in um, when Nash, when Kevin Rudd gave his right. speech thirteen yeah. years ago, but and then sixty years earlier, he's used these sort of real sepia colours and and stuff. And I, I was so fascinated, you know, when you told me what what you use to get a lot of this effect um, with <laughs> with the colours of, of the you know the more sepia browns and stuff. Yeah. Share that's that? cool. Yeah, well, I often think of, you know, it was a happy accident. I think I might have had, I think I had a cup of coffee on, um, you know, this is years and years ago. I had a cup of coffee um, and I, I had spilt it. And I think there were a few coffee rings on um, accidentally on an illustration uh, that I ended up just playing with. And I found, I mean, I found out about, um, yeah, this technique through an artist called Vic Munnitz. Um, from South America, and he paints with all sorts of things, um, spaghetti, um, junk, clouds, you know, water vapour. And um, one of the things he was experimenting with 
with was coffee and salt. And I mean, that just sort of plays into, you know, because you want, you want your illustrations to really reflect the text. And um, there's, so there's a little bit of grittiness in there from the salt. And I think that's sort of back, you know, it's a harsher time back then. So I just sort of wanted to reflect, you know, that and also just have it where it's, um, you know, in some ways the, the, these images, um, they, they are um, more alive than the ones with colour, um, you know, and it, it's, there's also that double entendre of like not seeing colour, um, you know, so it's, uh, there's a, yeah, there's a few, you know, you want to embed um, a few meanings in there um, just because of the content, you know, it needs to be um, respected in that way so that you know like i think you know I, we talked about it before that it took me a year an extra year to illustrate it um and you know by happenstance it, it that forced the publication to the book to be cut to um, be published on the 10th anniversary which was um you know i think and i think that was sort of um uh, that that really helped um you know, get the message of the book across being um, on the 10th anniversary. Absolutely. Yeah, it was supposed to come out the year before, but um, in the end it came out on the actual 10th anniversary of, of um, Kevin Rudd's speech, which was, yeah, which was incredible. And we're at mm. the launch on that day. And so, I, um, so t- tell us, tell us, um, Coral, <laughs> tell us what it was like to meet Kevin Rudd. Uh, I'm jealous. I'm jealous because I, di- I didn't get everybody. I didn't get to meet him. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it was a very. It was very much an honour. He he called called me up and and asked me to um, congratulate us both on on the um, on the win of of this particular book for the CBCA Awards, uh, mm-hmm. children, Australian Children's uh, Book Awards of the Year. Um, and yeah, so we just had a chat uh, about about the foundation, the uh, Apology Foundation, National Apology Foundation that he is chairman of. Um, we talked about this book, its significance, and also about how Australia, uh, you know, so yes, we've come a long way as a, as a nation, um, but yes, we've still got so far to go. We've still got, you know, we, we want to see the constitution change. We want to see representation in parliament. We want to see... Um, so much, you know, we want to see the outcomes of the Uluru Statement from the Heart um, achieved. So there, there's just so, still so much more that Australia needs to do um, in order to, to see our First Nations people um, acknowledged and, um, and, and given a voice and to, to be working together as, as a nation, as a people, as, as one, one people here in Australia. But that's 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 because he met you for coffee, didn't he? You know, and that's that speaks, um, you know, that speaks to how, you know, he is he he just didn't do it for political gain, you know. He, um, you know, Kevin's heart is there, you know, like from you know, taking the time out um, to to meet an author of a children's book and have coffee with them and talk about it. You know, it shows that he's, he, he, it's, um, it was a genuine act, you know, and something that he's still championing. So I think that's, yeah, it just, uh, I think that's, an, you know, that's amazing. That's just so cool that uh, he's, you know, he does that. And, and, you, and you need more people like that, you know. Maybe yeah, Kevin Rudd about- the book these concepts a little bit sure i i um yeah can you uh yeah that's that's good just on this the, with the nest yeah the empty nest uh and i think this this is a very early concept um where uh you know i i, I think i it was this is one of the very first drawings that i did and normally I'm just doing tiny little scribbles for a while and then working up to, um, 
some final art, but I, I just delved straight into this and I was just thinking about, um, it's, you know, it's connection to country really. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's yeah it was i think uh, it was it just sort of became it just wasn't striking the right tone well really quick before we move on because i've heard you talk about these before and it's so fascinating so this is sort of embodying the idea of the ch of the children alive right and well yeah. and then this yeah. is sort of you know if they had hatched there would have been shells here but they're going to right. been stolen and the nest is sort of died and and yeah. dried up now so i just wanted to yeah it's, it's yeah it's a destruction of home you know um I, I mean and see this this is um this is coming after drawing um uh i think i draw had i had done the um drawing of, of my mum and um but then i was experimenting with um just darker paper and I was also um, early early on. I was toying with the idea of actually having um, the sepia and the colour on the same page, mm. but actually having it as if it was ripped in half. Mm. Um, you know that whole sort of tearing apart of families. But I think that that um, yeah, it just design wise, it was just too. Um, there's too much going on and uh so it was confusing the message so yeah it's um mm, that was the very first and so this is the the um i was actually asked by the uh graphic designer when i handed this one and she said oh well just do them all um is that finished is that is that one of the finished ones and and i knew i had to to you know it's it's has to be the best book that you've done, um, just because of the 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 story, and um, it was getting there at this point. Like there's something there, you know. You can actually see this. The children are hiding. Um, they're in between his legs in the in the background. They're underneath the truck. Um, but it, you know, so it was sort of you always sort of it's like you're sculpting something you know if you're chipping away at the story and um finding what what works and and whatnot so it's uh yeah it's you know I've, I, I did so many um yeah a lot of work uh on this book just uh you know you could have a whole exhibition um wink wink nudge nudge <laughs> You know, it's uh, on the, just the 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 offhand sketches and um, the ideas because there's so many. Um, you know, all those stories from all those Aboriginal people about what um, they went through and uh, and you want to include all that stuff. Um, you know, or just sort of you want to be able to point people in that direction. To sort of say, have a look at this. There's some, you know, there's another rabbit hole here um, that you need you need to go down because um, there's so much more stuff there. And and also also there's you know like you, it's such a serious book and being able to impart that seriousness, um, not just with children. Well, I mean, really importantly for children, but. Um, just the, the the wider reader you know you don't want to steer away from how serious it was but you don't you know there are certain things you can do there are do's and don'ts in children's books and um you know one of them is um you know having guns in books is quite problematic and things like that so <clears throat> you ha you know you have to think about because you know it's some these look like these kids died and um, like the, when Coral was talking about the Kinchilla boys home and I've, I, I knew one, one old fellow from Kinchilla boy boys home and he was telling me, oh, he said the nuns were terrible to him 
and we'd beat him. And you know, and and there was there's a tree there where um, you know the boys were shackled to the tree, and they were left there. And I think the chain is still there on the tree. I think now it's a um, um, well, last I heard it was uh, a a rehabilitation clinic. I think they had turned it into the old Kinsella Boys Home. Uh, but it's, you know, it's heritage listed. Uh, so, you know, and they, they, those, those boys talk about, you know, men now, they talk about, yeah, those, those boys were beaten while they were chained up. And, um, yeah. you know, I know people that don't do that to dogs, you know. Um, and yeah. so it's sort of like, you, yeah, you want to point people in, in that direction. But just you know just nudge them and and you, you have to do that with a children's book you just you know it's sort of in in some ways it's not a children's book you know it's like an educational text really uh, so you know yeah is there um have we got any questions is yes any? but Deb, here's a really great question um um she said thank you kindly how widely known outside of australia is the solon generation's history and how much did sorry day broaden the education of all uh, generations in australia and around the world about about this history wow so uh, um so sort of two parts to that question uh yeah well i, I actually don't i don't think it's well known mm -hmm. um around the world you know I, I guess it's just it's the you know every country has histories that people don't know about um so the one thing i'll say just from engaging with visitors at Kuiru is that um the one thing that helps tremendously in raising awareness about the stolen generations at least in the united states or in the english-speaking world was rabbit proof fence um <laughs> rabbit proof fence is a really if you haven't seen it it's a really good film we there were some stills from it earlier and it really brings to life some of the some of that history um of the stolen generation so um that people people talk to me about that film a lot in the galleries hey crow welcome back <laughs> Um, Hello, yeah, uh, the question was how widely known outside Australia is the Stone Generation? That was the first part. And I was just talking about how Dub said it's not very well known. And I said, I agree, although I think Rabbit Proof Fence has has made a huge impact. Um, I still hear somebody just as as your exhibition has been up, Dub, we've had a lot of people um, mentioning that and making that connection between that film and your work. It's it's probably um... I mean, there's, there's, I think, you know, there's a few attempts with film. I think that's probably the only way that people would know. Uh, I don't think people would be actively searching for it um, in other countries. But I remember because it was touched on in um, the movie Australia with Hugh Jackman. And, and that was sort of, I think, you know, that was a postcard um, movie of Australia. Um, and I mean, you know, it definitely did have some serious, um, you know, themes in there. And that they, um, but it was just, it's probably, it's, you know, it was a light touch, um, you know. And, and I think, you know, and, and that's, that's good. I think that's um, things like that, you know, um, through films, uh, that's a good introduction. And that was the, the second part. Yeah, the second part of the question was how much did Sorry Day, I think um, she's referring to the book itself, um, or maybe the holiday as well, broaden the education of all generations in Australia and around the world. What do you think of that, Carl? I, I think that more and more it's, it's becoming more and more people are being educated here in Australia. So, like, even sort of three years ago when I was going into schools you know I that so few people knew about it um even though you know it's part of our history but the you know the last probably three years more and more people are knowing about it um it's been teachers are having to teach about uh, the stolen generations about reconciliation about you know sorry day national apology reconciliation week it's it is becoming 
more and more um, widespread. So, uh, yeah, slowly, slowly, I'd, slowly, I'd, slowly. Would you would you um, would you say it's sort of like there's two halves where, uh, you know, in schools that they you know there's a there's a section where they the schools have to teach it, and then there's the section where the, the schools want to teach it. You know, this um, like like yesterday for us, you know, social media was blowing up. Um, a lot of people were sharing the book. And um, and just talking about sorry day generally, um, which is you know that that's uh, you know that that's really cool. Um, but but you would go into schools and then you'd uh, and you know be like a um, yeah. And I mean, some teachers would say, "Oh, we have to teach this now." It's um, so you know it's, it'd be interesting to find out their thoughts. I actually. Um, yeah. I'll have to do that next time. It's it's. Uh, you know. I think it becomes a initially a I have to teach this, and then it, and then once they start and realize it's actual and it's not as it's not as you know it's not as hard mm -hmm. as they as it, mm -hmm. it appears to be. I think then then people want to and they realize it's it's so significant. It's so emotional. It's you know it's it's so crucial to to who we are as australia it's it's almost like um the word have takes on two meanings you know i i have to teach this or like no you have to teach this mm. you know um yeah absolutely yeah yeah so it becomes more powerful mm. yeah I know. it's um have you got any have, have you got any more questions yeah we just got one in um um, the U.S. government hasn't yet apologized. Um, hasn't yet apologized uh, to Native Americans, at least not officially, for taking their children away to Americanize them. Do you have thoughts about that? And what do we do beyond an apology? Great question. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I think you you know you're you're in a good position because you can sort of see what other countries are doing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of ways. Um, First Nations people in the states, you, you know, you we do share very similar experiences, um, and um, through colonization, and uh, you know, to you know, um, and even just looking at photos, you know, this I've seen so many photos of. Um, of Native American kids in schools, um, and they just look like Aboriginal um, kids in schools. You know, um, you know, back in the day, you know, they had the, they all had to wear the same clothes and have the same haircut, and um, you know, the, all this indoctrination. Uh, it's yeah, I think like I mean, sorry is the first step. That's mm. the first thing you say. Um, and then, and then it's just got to be, you know, the, the conversation and the action has to um, keep going. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, and um, it's, uh, that'd be, yeah, it, it would be interesting to see what happens um, over there with you guys. Yeah. What do you think, Coral? What do you yeah, I, I think there's something really powerful in acknowledgement and and because it says, you know, we see you, we we acknowledge, we acknowledge what we did, we acknowledge the past, we we see what happened and we say sorry, you know. So there's 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 something really powerful in that acknowledgement. And I think that's what happened in Australia when Kevin Wright said sorry. You know, it was more than just a word. Yes, it was a word on the day, but the word then has to lead to action. Um, but that acknowledgement, and, and that's what I found when I've spoken to lots of um, uh, First Nations people, is, is when, when there was finally this acknowledgement, it was like, oh, finally, finally, you know, finally, 
we're being seen finally we're being heard and there's and there's just there's real power in that but you know as as i said it's got to be more than just a word it there has to it has to then lead to action so mm. i think for america you know to to acknowledge that yes this happened to acknowledge that yes this was wrong uh and to to say sorry is is absolutely not only the first step but it's a crucial first step yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, just admitting that you know you're wrong, you know, and and uh, it's you know in some ways, yeah, I guess people take it personally, you know. I didn't do anything wrong, but you know, no one, no one, nobody is saying that, and uh, yeah, you, you just um, you know, but you sort of it, that becomes problematic because you're still not acknowledging something happened and so you're upholding that that um facade no i didn't i didn't know that i didn't you know it's, you know it's, i didn't care you know it's basically saying we, we don't care um and you know just by you know it's just i don't know it's a it's a no-brainer really you just um you know you just got to make sure that it doesn't happen again that sort of yeah yeah you know. um one of to what you both have just spoken to um the theme for this year's national reconciliation week in australia which starts um which i'll just say the dates because they're kind of for all, for all three of us um may 27th <laughs> through june 3rd is more than a word reconciliation takes action so I think that's definitely sort of a sentiment that is being talked about a lot right now in Australia is what does it mean um, to reconcile and that it is a lot more than just sort of, you know, um, lip service, uh, but there does need to be that mm. action um, followed up. There's one more sort of comment slash question. Um, is the general Australian population sorry? Question mark. It took the German people sometime after the fall of the Nazis many decades to admit their um to admit their actual culpability and we are still struggling with the right the right here in this country about native and african-american slavery and genocide there are no easy answers so maybe we can begin with our children to tackle some of our own issues of trauma which brings us full circle back to why this is such a wonderful children's mm. book <laughs> it's so important. yeah oh yeah but, do you all want to yeah. speak to whether you feel like the general Australian population? I'm sorry, I know it's hard to speak for <laughs> the whole country. I, I think more and more, you know, it, the more people know, the more they are educated, the more they they learn of the past, the more that they, yes, they are. You know, people, the more they learn, the more they're horrified that this actually happened in mm. this country. You know, a lot of people didn't even know uh, this happened. So the more the more there is education, which is why it's crucial to, you know, to, to educate our next generation of young people, the more people are sorry. So, you know, there's still people in this country that aren't, but I would say the majority are. The majority want to want to see reconciliation. The majority want to move forward uh, as a nation, um, all holding hands together as one people. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, just in the publishing space, you know, there's a lot of um, Indigenous content um, coming out now and, you know, writers are seeing the value in, um, in Aboriginal people in that sense. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, you do, I guess you do have the flip side where um, there's the cash-in crowd um, where they'll jump on the tails of those things and uh, which I mean that can be dangerous because then that's not handled properly and when the intent isn't pure um, and uh, it's but it's it's definitely on everyone's radar um, and there's uh, I mean it's yeah like it, I was talking to a cabbie about it the other day um you know and uh it's uh actually the um when we had the the launch um of the book coral at the um at the at the hotel 
uh, one of the staff was, um, they were, uh, I don't think I said the, what we were doing, but he just started talking about it. And he was asking, you know, he said, do you think, um, do you know, is there still work to be done? Like, you know, so, uh, you know, people are, uh, are conscious about it. And, uh, and I think there's that, there's a, a, a respectful hesitancy where people want to learn and they, they, and they see it on social media all the time. They, they want to, you know, not just be inclusive of, of, of um, uh, Aboriginal staff, but um, to be included in that conversation. Um, sort of seeing that, that there's a bit of a power shift there where people, in, instead of um, taking on, oh, well, I'm going to teach you this there in the learning role, um, which is, and that's uh, like, uh, you know, I think that's, that's it's really cool to, to see, you know, just to see that, I think. Mm. Well, I think that's a really good place for us to end. Um, I just want to thank you both so much for joining us this evening and for sharing your thoughts and knowledge with us. Um, it's been, it's gone in lots of really interesting directions and we've had some really good questions. So thanks to all of you who asked questions as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Everyone.